Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiria, a teaching ministry that teaches the Word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will continue our study through 1 Timothy. So we will cover 1 Timothy chapter 5. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace to be able to gather, to learn your word, to glean to your word. We pray that you will teach us today by your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. You will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding. Father God, as our heart conditions are different and the deepness of our roots varies, we pray that by the Holy Spirit, you will give us what we need to receive from today's teaching. You will minister to everyone simultaneously. You will help us to continue to be the light and the salt of the word in what we say and in what we do. Father God, your love and your mercy towards us endure forever. They are new every morning. As the psalmist said, when I remember the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have created. What is man that you are mindful of him? Son of man that you visit him. Yet you've created him a little lower than the angels. When I remember your thoughts, O oh Lord, they are so much great. Your thoughts towards me, they are perfect. Great is the number of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Father, we pray that you will help us to love one another. You will help us to care for one another, especially those that are in need. For everything you've done for us, we give you all the glory. We say thank you, O Lord. We appreciate everything that you've done for us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, welcome. Today we will continue our study through 1 Timothy. So we'll cover 1 Timothy chapter 5. Um... Paul started the church at Ephesus. He pastored it for about um, three years. But he left Timothy behind when he went to the area of Macedonia. It was his intention to come back and visit Timothy. But before that, he wrote Timothy a letter instructing him on how things should be done in the house of God. So you see that the, uh, uh, so many instructions in the first letter of uh, Paul to Timothy about the conduct of the church. So we'll go ahead and start. In verse 1, it says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, Older men, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. This is part of the instruction that uh, Paul gave to Timothy. Now he tells him how to correct people. For an older man, he wants Timothy to correct that one as his own father. You know, there are uh, 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 some older people who don't want to be corrected by a younger person. And we know that Timothy was in his mid-thirties when Paul wrote him this letter. So he wants him to correct an older man with respect, with uh, dignity, with honor. For a younger uh, person, he wants Timothy to correct that one as though that person is a brother to him. 
to a young man. How do you correct your own brother? With love, with kindness. For an older woman, he says, correct that person as though she is your mother. How do you correct your own mother? With love, with kindness. Even though you delivered your message, but uh, you did it out of love. Now, for a young girl to correct that young girl as though she is your own biological sister, very important, without any sexual attachment. It is evil for a minister to take advantage of a, a woman in the church. Some have done this in the past. There are some who are still doing it today. The problem is that uh, it will cause that sister to stumble. Someone that Christ died for. You will leave them in regrets and, uh, and in, uh, in, in, in condemnation. And as a result of this, sometimes they will depart from the faith. It's not also good for the minister. Because it is a pure disobedience of the word of God. There are ministers today uh, 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 who have departed the, the faith because, because they fell into sexual sins. There are some churches today that no longer exist because of things like this. As a minister, do not create an occasion for any sexual immorality. It is a temptation. Sometimes the devil will like to tempt you in this area. Remember, Paul told Timothy to flee youthful lust. Don't create an occasion. If you would counsel a Christian lady, very, very important that you bring in the third person in that room so that both of you are not left alone. If they invite you for dinner or for lunch, take your wife with you so that you don't create any occasion at all for any sexual sin causing someone to stumble. Do not say that I am strong, I, I, I'm going to overcome the temptation. Oh no, don't say that. Remember, Joseph, when he flew, when he flew from uh, Potiphar's wife, the Bible tells us that he ran and he left his clothes. If Joseph would have said, I am strong, after all, it is my boss wife, I'm going to go there and minister to, 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 to her and tell her about Jehovah. <laughs> Maybe the outcome would not have been the same. So we don't create any room for any temptations at all. In verse 3, it says, Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. Paul will now give him, uh, Timothy, guidelines for enrolling widows for church support. The time when Paul wrote this letter, uh, it was a practice of the church to help young widows. To support them financially. At that time, because of what women were limited to do, it was very easy for a widow to starve to death. Women were highly disregarded. It was a male-dominated world or culture. 
So the church took it upon themselves to help out widows financially. But because their funds were limited, Paul wants to make sure that those that are being helped are true widows. We see this activity in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. You know, when the Hellenistic Jews, which means uh, uh, Jewish women with uh, Greek background, when they uh, complained that they were being left out on the daily distribution of welfare, as a result of this, so that everybody is taken care of, the apostles appointed seven deacons. Philip, Stephen were part of these deacons to help in the daily distributions so that they can commit themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word of God. So we see this practice way back. So now, he tells Timothy that if a, a widow has children or grandchildren, then it becomes the responsibility of their children to take care of their widows. Because this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Remember the commandment, honor your father and your mother. Now, this is one of the ways that you can honor your parents if, to help them out in the times of need. This is a way to um, reciprocate or to pay back that uh, investment with the poor into your life. So, he says, I want the family members to be the ones in charge first before the church will become involved. In verse um, 5, now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. He continues to give the criteria to enroll a widow for church support. So he says, a true widow is someone who is uh, left alone without anybody helping her. Someone who continues to trust God for her providence, who is not willing to do anything just to get money because she's a widow. Someone who is prayerful, or we can say a prayer warrior. <laughs> he says, this is a hallmark of a true widow. Now, he brings in a, a contrast here. Now, he's going to talk about uh, uh, someone who is not a true widow, an ungodly widow. So, an ungodly widow is that one who will live for pleasure. Who is willing to indulge in any uh, ungodly activity. Someone who is carnally minded. And sometimes you will see these ones, uh, maybe you know one or two people. The way they will dress, the way they will talk, and they are out there to lure people into sexual sins. So he's talking about these ones. For the Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. One who goes in this direction, Paul describes that one as being dead while they are alive. What does that mean? It simply means that someone who is spiritually dead, someone who is not born again. For the Bible talks about different types of death. Physical death. Physical death is the separation of a one spirit or conscience from his own body. Sometimes the Bible will use the terms, the term asleep to describe this. 
And why he says that is because of this. If that one is a Christian, they are just temporarily asleep. On the rapture day, they will be raised up. Because the Bible says, and the dead will be raised up first. We who are alive and still remain will be caught up with them in the cloud to meet with the Lord in the air. So the Bible uses the term asleep. You know, when Jesus Christ was referring to the death of Lazarus, he says, Lazarus is asleep. One thing with physical death is it is an appointment that everyone who is born on this earth must meet, must keep this appointment. For it is appointed unto men who wants to die, and after this is judgment. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. The statistics on this is very high <laughs> because one out of one dies. <laughs> you must keep this appointment. The only way that you cannot keep this appointment is you, you, you are alive when the rapture happens. <laughs> because the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we all will be changed. So that's the only way to escape this. Now, another type of death is spiritual death. And that's what he's talking about here. So in a spiritual death, one spirit is separated from the spirit of God. It becomes an inheritance. Anyone who came into this world was born on dead on arrival, spiritually dead on arrival. Not because of what you did, but because of what you inherited from Adam and Eve. So the good news about this type of death is that it's an escape. In a physical death, there is no escape. But in this one, you can escape by being born again, receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Another type of death is second death. Now, anyone who is not born again, when they die, they will go into second death. The second death will happen after the white throne judgment of God. When the dead will be raised up. And they will be judged according to the things written in the book. And if anybody's name was not found written in the last book of life, he was cast into Gehenna. That is second death. So Paul says, anyone who is living in this, in this manner is not a true widow. So do not enroll them for church support. That's what he's saying here. Now we are in verse, um, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If we take this in context... He's talking about, remember, widows. So he says, family members who have the means to help out widows in their families, but they are not doing it. He says they are worse than unbelievers because they are hearers and not doers. Even unbelievers will help out their widows. In verse um, 9, do not let a widow under 60 years of old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has large strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work, he continues to give uh, Timothy the criteria here to recruit widows for church support. A widow has to be someone 60 years and above. So, and it has to be someone who, is, uh, who has a very good reputation. Someone who has raised up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Someone who has showed hospitality to strangers. 
In other words, he's talking about a good Christian woman. This is the one who is qualified to be a true widow. In verse 11, but refuse the younger widows from when they have begun to grow wanting against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossipers and busy bodies. Saying things which they ought not, therefore I desire that the younger women, widows marry. Bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak uh, reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. He talks about the younger widows now. They should not be enrolled. For church support. And he gives his reasons. Reason number one. He says that these young widows. Uh, for you to understand. What he's saying here. You have to know that. Uh, when they. Selected these widows. For church support. When they enrolled them. They took vows, or you can say a commitment or a pledge to remain widows and help out in the church while they will receive financial support from the church. Paul is saying here, there are some, after they made their vows, after they have made their commitment, left because they went and they got married. They went and uh, took a, a husband. And therefore, they went into condemnation. Paul is saying, it is better not to recruit them in the first place than to let them go through this process of condemnation. Reason number two, if these widows, young, younger widows were recruited, then they will have so much time on their hands. And because of this, they will turn around and they will become busybodies, <laughs> gossipers, <laughs> going from one house to another, causing havoc and destruction. Remember, idle hands are devil's workshop. So Paul says, spare them this process. Do not recruit them. Rather, let them remarry and bear children so that they will spend their time in raising up their children. So that they will not give an occasion for Satan to use them as an instrument of destruction, defiling other people. That's what he's talking about here. Is an application of wisdom of God. In verse 16, it says, If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened, burdened that he may relieve those who are really widows. He reiterates what he said earlier because church funds were limited at this point. He wants the family members to be the number one to take care of the widows so that the church will concentrate or focus on those who are true widows without anyone helping them. Verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and the doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while he thrusts out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. The word elders here is the word presbyterios. That's the Greek word. 
And in the New Testament, it is interchangeable with um, a bishop, episcopus, or a pastor, or a shepherd, or an overseer. So for the purpose of this teaching, I will, can use any one of them. It still means the other. So he says, for an elder, for overseers, they deserve double honor. What does he mean by double honor? He's talking about respect and support. So there is nothing wrong to support a congregation, to support their ministers, overseers, pastors financially. If they have the means. There is a difference between a higher link and uh, supporting a pastor. Now, a higher link is someone that you will pay money for their services. So sometimes they are in there for what they're going to get out. Uh, they're really not in there for the service. Maybe they want to be paid. That's the reason why they are there. So you pay the money for their services. For a pastor, you use the word support. Because the pastor, he has sacrificed his uh, time in teaching the word of God, in learning and teaching the word of God. And because he has some needs, then the church will support him so that he will continue studying the word of God and helping them grow spiritually. He says there is nothing wrong with that. He brings in an analogy here, the ask analogy. <laughs> so he says, you do not muscle the mouth of the ox which traders out the grain. Let me explain this to you. Back in the days, even in the day and in the age we live, when the farmers cut down the sheaves of grain, they will lay them in a threshing floor. You know, on a threshing floor, a threshing floor is a concrete floor. So they will lay the sheaves on the threshing floor. And now they will pair few oxen, oxen together. Uh, and they will make the oxen to work on top of the sheaves so that their weight will separate the grain from the husk. And after this is done, they will go into the process called winnowing, which is they will use a long fork and they will throw it in the air. The wind will blow the chaff away, leaving the grain on the floor. That's what he's talking about here. So he says, while the husk or the husken are doing this work, Walking on top of the uh, of the sheep so that the grains can be separated from the husk. He says, do not cover their mouth. Allow them to eat. To be partakers of what they are doing. He gets this quotation uh, uh, directly from Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4. And he also used this quotation in 1 Corinthians. Jesus Christ also said that... Uh, a laborer deserves his own wages. So Paul quotes both Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 and also the words of Jesus Christ. So if any church has the means to be able to support the ministers, the deacons, go ahead. It is a good thing to do. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse... Um, 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. So he's possibly talking to an overseer of uh, pastors and uh, uh, ministers and deacons. Or he could be talking to the church board, the board members. He says, always verify an accusation. Do not draw conclusions based on one person's complaint. 
For the Bible says, out of the mouth of one or two witnesses, let every word be established. There are some people out there, their plan and their purpose is to bring a minister or a pastor down because of personal purposes or interest. Sometimes just because they want to get even. Because the pastor or the overseer is not in support of their devious ways. So they want to bring him down. They want him out. So Paul advises here, do your research. Do your investigation before you will render a judgment. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Hadonai. In verse 20, those who are seen in rebuke in presence of all, that the rest also may fear. Just as a minister of God or a pastor is an example, he bears the light for so many people to follow. The same way if they continue to do or indulge in evil practices. If they continue, he says, rebuke them in the open. For this reason that others will take correction. So they don't say, if the pastor is doing this, then nothing is wrong with it, you know. So he says, rebuke that one in the open. But you got to apply wisdom on this. For in the day and in the age that we live, where they have so many laws and the amendments of laws. <laughs> every now and then, you see the Congress, you know, enacting new laws every day. <laughs> Someone can easily sue you if they are rebuked in the open. So you got to apply wisdom in this area. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. He says, treat everyone the same. Equal. He says, there should not be any partiality or preferential treatment or prejudice in the assemble of the faithful. For the simple reason that God is not a respecter of persons. In the presence of God, there is nothing like secondhand citizens. Remember what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse uh, uh, 28. For there is neither Jew nor Greek. For there is neither a, a, a bond nor free. For there is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ. And we see James. Uh, 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 he gives us uh, an analogy concerning this. In James chapter 2 verse 2. He talks about if someone comes into your assembly. Well dressed. You know, with gold rings. <laughs> and another one comes in, dressed in filthy rags. And then you say to the one who is well dressed, sit over here. And then to the other one that is dressed in filthy rags, stand over there at the corner. He says, have you not rendered impartial judgment? That's what he's saying here. So, there are some churches when you go in there, you can easily tell that uh, everybody is not allowed to sit anywhere, regardless of how early you came to church. <laughs> Which means they have places for that big nitrous. <laughs> but it's telling us here, he says, God is not a respecter of persons. God does not have grandchildren. He only has children. So everybody is what? Equal and same in the presence of God the Almighty. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He continues to tell uh, Timothy here uh, uh, not to create an occasion as a minister. 
Do not create an occasion where you can be lobbied with money or gifts. Because this will render your judgment uh, 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 um, uh, 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 ineffective. This will cause you to show partiality. In verse um, 22, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Do not lay hands or ordain people into the ministry very fast. Remember, it is God who calls people into the ministry. So, you have to make sure that these people are called into the ministry before you will lay hands on them just to ratify their call before men. If you do it in this manner, you will have people who will cause the church to grow spiritually. But if you do otherwise, you will have nothing but a higher lens. They may be growing the church, but you will have a lot of spiritual babies because all they're doing is to entertain the people, you know, tell them uh, funny stories. Also, you do not uh, put baby Christians into leadership positions. If someone is just a baby Christian, I mean, they just got born again. Do not put them into leadership positions. If you do this, in the process, they will get puffed up with pride. And then they can be blown away with the, the first wind of trial and tribulation that will come their way. And when they fall, sometimes they will drag other people with them. Because there are people now who've trusted and believed in what they are doing and what they are teaching. In their leadership. He continues to say, do not be conformed to this word. In other words, do not be the one that follow people's opinion. Do not be a man pleaser or an oh yes member. When you've had something or when you want to put something in practice, always use the word of God as the guideline. Let the word of God be your light and your guide. In making decisions. That's what he's saying. Before you put that thing in practice. Before you announce that thing. Before you do it. Think about it. What does the word of God say about what you're about to do now? So do not follow after other people's sins. Because they did this or they did that. Then you want to be a member of, or partaker of their sins. He says, no. Rather let the word of God be your guide. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. I've read so many commentaries about this, and there are some who say that God, he doesn't heal all the time. And there are some who say that uh, Paul is just telling Timothy to drink some wine. There are some who say that Paul prayed for Timothy to be healed of his infirmity, but he was not healed. But I see something different here. I see the application of uh, God's wisdom when it comes to living healthy. Let me give you an example. You work in a chemical company. And anytime your hands have direct contact with these chemicals, it peels off your skin. But anytime you cover your hands with gloves, it doesn't happen. So it will be wisdom of God 
for you to always wear gloves. Instead of you praying to God all the time, heal my skin, God, heal my skin, heal my skin, God. In this case, there is a remedy, something that you can do to avoid the problem. Application of God's wisdom. Paul tells Timothy here, because Timothy had a frequent uh, infirmities. The time he wrote this letter, the uh, did not have clean water. So people often got sick because of the water they drink. But there was remedy. The remedy was to mix like uh, two parts of wine in three parts of water and then drink. It took care of the bacteria. It took care of the bugs. So Paul tells Timothy, he says, don't go, do not continue uh, 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 getting sick all the time from this water that you're drinking that is not clean. Rather, put some wine in it. So here, wine becomes a medicine, not a beverage. So I see the wisdom of God in this. Because you do in this, does not mean that you don't have faith to receive healing from God. But there comes a time when you apply wisdom so you don't get sick in the first place. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse 24 and 25. Some mercies are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident. And those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Friends, sin is sin. Evil is evil. It's a matter of time it will be judged. There are sometimes we see people receive judgment and you will say, serves them right. You knew it was coming to them because of the way they live. And there are times people don't get judgment and they think, it is a license from God for them to continue to indulge in their ungodly activities. For a Christian, remember, the Bible says there will be a day when you're going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things done in the body. That day, many will receive rewards and many will lose rewards. For Paul says, Every man's work will be tried with fire. If anyone has built with uh, 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 gold, silver, and precious stones, he said they will receive rewards. But those who build with straw, with uh, hairs, and also with uh, wood, their works will be devoured with fire. So there will not be any reward for them. On the contrary, he talks about good. Good is always good. <laughs> Regardless if you think you've received the reward here or not. That is also going to be the judgment seat of Christ. Just the, 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 the judgment seat of Christ. Just like I said, when are you going to receive reward? But there are so many people who reason this way. They measure the goodness of God, his reward, his uh, blessing towards us by what they can see, by physical manifestations, by money, by wealth. So oftentimes we will indulge in this kind of uh, uh, thinking that uh, we, have, we, we, we put so much time in the things of God. We, 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 we volunteer our time. So we, we're giving so much services. We, we're putting our finances into the advancement of the kingdom of God. But it doesn't seem like we are seeing any reward or any, any, anything uh, happening to our finances. I mean, this is the way we reason sometimes. And we forget about the invisible hands of God. We look at the spectacular, we, 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 we are looking for the spectacular. And then we, 
We, we, we forget about the supernatural. Let me give you some examples. It was the plan of the enemy to get rid of you in an accident. So he planned it. To eliminate you completely. Even your family members in that car. But it did not happen. God prevented it from happening. You did not even know that such thing was uh, uh, prevented from happening by God. The invincible hands of God. The enemy planned to put sickness on your body. Sickness that will cost you money and time and even take your life. But it never happened. And every day you are enjoying good health and the divine health. And someone somewhere is praying, Oh God, if I can breathe one single day without oxygen support. Another one is saying, Oh God, if I can get up and walk on my feet without these clutches for just one day. And another one says, God, if I can swallow food. Just one day without me being fed to my veins. But we don't see all of these things, the invisible hands of God. You were supposed to make this big mistake, maybe in your business or in your finances, in your life. A mistake that would have cost you so much. So much pain and regret. A mistake that would have taken you back 20 years, 30 years. But you did not make that mistake. And you didn't even know such a thing happened. The invisible hands of God. In the place where you work. Even in your, in your businesses, they plan to eliminate you. They've done so many things to get rid of you. To make your business collapse. But every time they plan, God will intervene on your behalf. He will paralyze the activities and the plans and the plots. Rather than you falling down on your face, flat, in poverty, you continue to grow. You continue to prosper. But you didn't even know that God has prevented all of this from happening to you. The invincible hands of God. So friends, regardless if you can measure rewards while you are here on earth, Continue to do good. There are so many things we don't see. The Bible says, do not be wary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap, if you do not give up. The Bible says that those that turn many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever. Continue to advance the kingdom of God. Do the right thing. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God will never forget your labor of love. Good friends of mine, I've come to the end of today's teaching. If you're hearing my voice today and you are not yet born again, or maybe you wandered away from Jesus Christ, but today you want to be born again or you want to come back to him. Today is another opportunity for you to do that. Remember, there are so many people who don't understand what it means to be born again. This is the reason why we have so many church members who are not born again. Because these are the people who want to have access to God through their works, through their good behavior and efforts. This kind of people who wants to get hold of God through human uh, achievements. 
instead of divine accomplishment. So to be born again means that uh, you receive a free gift that Jesus Christ has made available to anyone and you receive it by faith. By believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he died for your sins. God raised him up from the dead. Then you ask him to come into your life, be your Lord and your Savior. You begin a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. There is no other way to do it. You must do it through Jesus Christ. That's why in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. So you only go through Jesus. There is no way around it. There are so many religions in the world and they, most of them believe that all roads lead to God, to heaven. But that's not true. The Bible says that if you reject Jesus Christ, it simply means that you, you rejected the Father also. But anyone who acknowledges the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will also have the Father. So you cannot choose and pick which one you're going to have or the other. Both, they go together. Jesus and the Father, they go together. Jesus Christ said, if you see me, you see the Father. I and the Father, we are one. Procrastination is a theft of time. There are so many people who have lost valuable things on this earth because they were procrastinating. They kept putting things off and off and off. A common practice. There are many who have died and they went to hell because they procrastinated. They did not receive Jesus Christ when they had the good news. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. When you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. Today, about 155,000 people died in the world. So do not say, I'm going to do it later. No, you got to make the choice. As soon as, you, as soon as you hear the voice, you are hearing that voice today. Don't put it off any longer. The only way that you can have access to heaven is if you are born again. And I'm about to lead you in a very short prayer today. So that if you would die, you will have access to God, the Father in heaven. Hell is a real place. It is a place where people go, those who rejected Jesus Christ, as the Lord and Savior, while they were still alive on this earth. A place of torment and torture, darkness, where people will burn with fire and brimstone for eternity. Don't go that route. You are the only one who's going to make this decision because you cannot go to heaven on your father or your mother's tail coat. No. Everybody comes for, their, for, for, for themselves. Jesus Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. So you are the one who's going to open that door, make that connection, make that movement to receive salvation that is already available for you at no cost, but by faith you receive it. I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. Pray it with your heart and mean it. And right now you will be born again. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. You will become a child of God. A Christian. Pray, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe he is your son that he died for my sins. You raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. 
I believe that I am now born again. My sins are washed away. And I turn away from my sins. Father God, I give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Congratulations. I welcome you to the kingdom of God if you say that prayer. Find a good church where they teach the word of God so that you can grow in your faith. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. This is the only way you can grow. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. Do not let Satan take advantage of what you did just right now. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. Those that are helping us spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to other people through their prayers for this ministry, their financial commitment, and their services. We say thank you so much. If you want to be a partner to this ministry, please go to our website. It is kuim.org. It is only those who hear the word of God and they do the word of God. They are the ones who will receive the benefits of the word of God. So be a doer of the word of God. My friends, I pray for you this day. May the Lord be with you. May he bless you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, sound mind, even in the midst of trouble. And supply your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And give you divine health. And give you wisdom to make the right choices in your life. May he bless your weak and deliver you from every destruction. And everybody said, Amen. My good friends, regardless of what you are going through, see them as things that are temporary. For surely there is an end and your own expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Glory. Hallelujah. Mandos kubra ekle engrotosu kubashere kera pata. In a fan glotus to cobra get them manjeri produce to para LPT, prakata pali a la sot. Uje gere mason de le funde le pragado suco bochete, prakata, prakata, adi gronosco buje di musco praden. Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiri, a teaching ministry that teaches the word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.